Settler violence, raids, demolitions, a dramatic rise in Israeli attacks across the occupied West Bank since the start of the war on Gaza. The US and the West have criticized Israel's actions against Palestinians there, but will they stop it? This is Inside Story. Hello again, I'm James Bays. While the global gaze has been on what some have called a genocide in Gaza, the occupied West Bank too has seen a rise in Israeli violence since October the 7th. More than 130 Palestinians have been killed since then. Raids, demolitions, attacks by settlers have become a near daily occurrence in what's been described as the worst year for Palestinians in recent memory. World powers have begun to speak out against Israel's actions in the occupied West Bank, but can they pressure it to stop the violence and its illegal settlement activity? We'll discuss all of this with our panel of guests in a moment. But first, Victoria Gatenby has our update. Israeli settlers attack Palestinian homes near Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. The UN's Human Rights Office says such attacks have increased significantly since Israel's war on Gaza began more than three weeks ago. <laughs> Mohammed's family was targeted when settlers and Israeli soldiers stopped a funeral cortege for three Palestinians killed by settlers on Tuesday. My father and brother and others from the village were at the intersection. The settlers started shooting people. My brother was shot in the neck and back. My father was also shot and it took him 10 minutes to die. Raids by the Israeli military in the occupied West Bank have also increased since October the 7th. The Janine refugee camp has long been a center for Palestinian armed resistance to Israel's illegal occupation. Nadi Nimir and her family are enduring nightly raids. We try to find the furthest, safest corner in the house to hide in. The sound of the explosions is terrifying. I've had to take her to the hospital twice because she went into shock. It's the same for all families. We're struggling to cope. The UN says 1,000 Palestinians have been displaced in the occupied West Bank in the past three weeks. A top UN human rights official who resigned citing the agency's handling of the war in Gaza says what's happening in the occupied West Bank is textbook genocide. Usually the most difficult part of proving genocide is intent. In this case, the intent by Israeli leaders has been so explicitly stated and publicly stated by the prime minister, by the president, by senior cabinet uh, ministers, by military leaders, that that is an easy case to make. The United States says it's deeply concerned by what it calls the uptick in violence against Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. It's urged Israel to prevent attacks. As the mass killing of civilians in Gaza continues, Palestinians in the occupied West Bank are suffering too what the UN describes as an unfolding crisis. Victoria Gatenby for Inside Story. Well, let's discuss all of this more now with our panel of guests. And in Oslo, we have Jaus Hiltemann, who is programme director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. In Ramallah, in the occupied West Bank, Mariam Barghouti, policy analyst with the Palestinian Policy Network. And in London, Toby Cadman, an international human rights lawyer and a specialist in war crimes. Thank you, all of you, for spending time with us. We are going in this programme to be discussing the West Bank and the very desperate situation in the West Bank right now. But I'd like to start with you, Mariam, as the death toll in Gaza now goes over 9,000. How are people in the West Bank watching the events in Gaza? Because I know many people have family or extended family there. Right. Palestinians in the West Bank are horrified in what's happening in Gaza in terms of genocidal practices um, against Palestinians there. You've had close, more than 9,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza, and you've had more than 1,000 bombs a day being dropped. That's equivalent to a missile or an airstrike per every Palestinian killed in Gaza. And in the West Bank, you've had 141 Palestinians killed since October 7th, um, 340 Palestinians killed since the beginning of the year. That's before um, the, the large-scale military uh, genocide that's happening in Gaza. So for Palestinians, it's it's 
watching their own people get killed while also expecting a large scale military invasion in the West Bank, as well as a slaughter by Israeli settlers who are being heavily armed by the Minister of National Security. And the Israeli military, meanwhile, is accelerating its detention of Palestinians. We've had almost 2,000 Palestinians, or 1,900 to be exact, arrested since the beginning of the year. And you have 2,000 Palestinians being held in Israeli military prisons um, under administrative detention. That means there is no actual charge um, against them, and, and they're not even afforded trial. So you can see the escalation of that. And then comes the, the labor workers from Gaza that got stuck in the West Bank, quite literally running for their lives um, from, from within the, the Israeli settlements that they were working in. Uh, and either trying to come to the West Bank or find refuge. And you have Israeli soldiers stripping them and stepping on their heads. So the crimes of, of genocide and ethnic cleansing are not exclusive to Gaza. But what is horrifying in Gaza is, is the intensity and the, the speed in which it is happening. But that is the large-scale Israeli project to, to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. And that's what we're seeing happening here. Yaust, if I can ask you about these figures, because um, you have monitored the situation in the West Bank for many years. Uh, according to the UNRWA Commissioner General, the Palestinian fatalities are the highest since the UN started keeping records in 2005, and they were highest by, by before the events of October. Uh, and, and it's worth noting that last year was the previous grim high. We clearly see uh, an escalation in the West Bank. And that was happening well before October 7th uh, and before the Gaza war. Um, and of course, uh, now we're seeing uh, even a spike uh, on top of that. Um, and that is uh, particularly worrisome because uh, the Gaza war could lead to a much wider conflict. Uh, and uh, one place where uh, this could be triggered is indeed in the West Bank. So um, if the situation gets out of hand because of some massacre committed by settlers, for example, uh, or the Israeli army uh, shooting at protesters, or even the PA shooting at protesters, then um, we, could, we could see a, a new outburst of violence in the West Bank. Uh, and that could maybe tip the balance regionally because we are seeing uh, actors, Iran-backed groups, already uh, uh, targeting Israel from afar. Um, not very effectively, and I think uh, on purpose, but that could change. That could change um, as soon as something really uh, goes terribly wrong in the West Bank, in addition to what is already happening in Gaza, which is horrific. Toby, if I, we're going to talk about Israel's culpability here. First, perhaps you can help me. Israel is the occupying power under international law, isn't it? What obligations does it have? Thank you. Well, look, certainly, and I think we've, we've, we've spoken about this uh, repeatedly recently, and this is not, unfortunately, this is not a new phenomenon that we're looking at. This has been going on for years. But yes, um, Israel is an occupying authority under the Fourth Geneva Convention. There are responsibilities that uh, attach to that, um, moving populations into occupied areas. Um, constitutes a war crime, moving populations either uh, internally or externally, and can also uh, amount to to a war crime. And we, we've we've been looking at this for a number of years. Uh, I myself um, travelled to to East Jerusalem in in 2016 to to, to look at the the question of settlements and and forced displacement. We took this to the International Criminal Court. We know that this is something that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is looking at. We know that Fatou Ben Souda, the previous um, chief prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, ha had identified this as one of the areas that her office is looking into. So regardless of what we see happening on the 7th of October and regardless of the, the horrific crimes we see being committed on Gaza, there, there is nonetheless um, war crimes being committed in, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. I mean, we, we've known that for some time. Um, and we really need to move forward with holding those individuals accountable for their actions and, and the, the actions of settlers who, who are unleashing violence on, on Palestinians in the West Bank 
um, that falls under the responsibility of Israel for failing to prevent and failing to punish that. Mariam, if I can focus on the death toll right now, I've found something uh, written by the humanitarian arm of the UN, OCHA. It says, of the Palestinian fatalities since the 7th of October, almost 50% were killed during confrontations that followed Israeli search and arrest operations, 35% in the context of demonstrations in solidarity with Gaza. So 50% raids, I think we would say, and 35% demonstrations. Does that match with what you're seeing and hearing on the ground? So, no, the number of Palestinians being targeted um, uh, in, in search and arrest invasions and, and just terrorizing missions uh, is actually higher. And you've had Israeli uh, military and Israeli forces target Palestinian civilians as well um, and claim that it was done in, in self-defense, claim it was done because there was a protest or a riot, even though, you know, you wouldn't, the protest wouldn't have had started then. But what I'm also seeing on the ground is that Israeli forces are hardly even using uh, tear gas. They're going straight for the lethal weapons, uh, and that's live ammunition. And a lot of the, the killings, you can see, they're, they're targeted. So they're killing Palestinians by directly shooting either their chest or their head. But what's scarier than this is that since the beginning of the year, the broad majority of Palestinians killed by Israel are children and minors. And that same trend applies in Gaza. So it's, it's not just, um, you know, where the Palestinian is being killed. The issue is that a Palestinian is being killed. Uh, you, 26 days more than uh, 9,000 Palestinians killed around uh, historic Palestine. These numbers are fine. So in the West Bank, we're only seeing what's going to be worse, unfortunately, because on Gaza, when, when Israel had dropped almost 6,000 bombs by October 12th, and nobody said anything, uh, the number of Palestinians killed skyrocketed from 3,000 to what we're seeing now. Uh, almost reaching 10,000. So it's really important to recognize that in the West Bank, a similar phenomenon will happen, and that is settlers will exponentially increase their attacks on Palestinians. Just in the past 72 hours, I have seen a significant increase in settlers attacking Palestinian villages and Israeli forces, forces invading Palestinian towns, including Ramallah this morning, where they killed two Palestinians. One of them was a 14-year-old and then shot from the illegal settlement across from the cemetery in Ramallah at the mourners. And, and this all happened before noon. I expect to see an intensification of settler attacks joined by the military. And I think that's the scary part. It's not where um, the Palestinian is being killed. It's that the Palestinian will be killed. That's the promise that Israeli forces and settlers have been saying verbatim. Yeah, with regard to the demonstrations, clearly people in the West Bank seeing what is going on in Gaza want to demonstrate. I think I'm right in saying that um, under the Israeli military law, you can't have a demonstration without more than 10 people. Um, otherwise, you would need permission from the military that doesn't give permission. Is that right? Well, you know, I, do, I think it's totally irrelevant because Palestinians will demonstrate uh, with or without a permit. They're certainly not going to ask the Israeli uh, occupation for a permit. Um, the, the problem is more that, uh, first of all, Palestinians are fragmented. So if there's going to be demonstrations, they would have to be strictly local and are not probably coordinated very effectively. Um, secondly, the Palestinian Authority itself is trying to to prevent demonstrations uh, because that is their they see that as their role and that is very unfortunate because uh, the Palestinian Authority should really be presenting the Palestinian population of the occupied West Bank. Instead, we see that it is actually acting more as a security arm of Israel, uh, in addition to its its uh, its governing role in providing essential services to people. It's also very corrupt. In any case, uh, demonstrations will happen. Uh, regardless, Palestinians have shown time and again that they will risk their lives uh, going out to the streets when they see that their uh, fundamental interests and rights are being violated. Toby, in terms of these demonstrations where the Israeli security forces are using live ammunition, just to be absolutely clear, is there any excuse for that in international law to disperse protesters no. with live ammunition? No. 
I mean, we've, we've looked at it in other jurisdictions, and frankly, and I have to say this, um, um, if, if, if this was happening anywhere else in the world, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. And I, and I think we have to have the courage to say that, that we're having this discussion because of it's, it's Israel and Palestine. Um, it, is, it is ludicrous to suggest that it is justified to use live ammunition to 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 dispel um, a, a what is arguably a peaceful demonstration. I mean, we, we've looked at it in the context of Syria. Do, 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 do we support the Assad regime in using live ammunition to kill hundreds, if not thousands, of protesters there? No, of course we don't. Um, do, do we allow that in Bangladesh? Do we allow that in the Philippines? No, of course we don't. We condemn it. Um, and I mean, worryingly, we also have the, the defense minister, the very right-wing uh, uh, defense minister, who, who's calling for greater powers for, for, for police and law enforcement to use live ammunition without warning. I mean, the, the, the whole concept um, is deeply, deeply disturbing. So, Toby, just to be clear, because at the beginning of the programme we heard um, a, a, a extract of an interview Al Jazeera did with the former head of the UN Human Rights Office in New York. He has quit his job saying it's a textbook case of genocide. Do you agree with that? I think we have to be careful. We have to analyse it when we're talking about a legal definition of a matter that is that is very difficult to establish. I, uh, I've recently said that you know when we look at the conflict in Bosnia, and there was only one small uh, aspect of the conflict that, that was that was deemed to amount to the crime of genocide. It's a very difficult uh, matter to, to prove. Um, but when you have statements such as um, Gaza needs to be flattened. Gaza needs to be wiped out, uh, and and targeting the entire uh, Palestinian uh, people. Then you know this has all of the hallmarks um, of genocide. Um, one of the questions that came up recently is is whether uh, the 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 removal or attempted extermination of a political movement um, can amount to to genocide. Now that's not what is covered in the genocide convention. You know it it, it is. It, there are certain protected groups that we look at when we look at uh, the crime of genocide, um, but we're not talking about just the extermination of Hamas as a uh, as a movement, political or mil military. We're talking about targeting all Palestinians. Uh, we we heard uh, repeated statements from from Israel Israeli politicians calling for the complete removal. I mean. That is disturbing language, and, and, and of course, that that approaches the, the definition of genocide. But again, we, we shouldn't always look at things of international crimes on a sliding scale of severity. I mean, even even if we don't establish this as, as genocide, I mean, war crimes, crimes against humanity being being committed um, on on a truly massive scale. I mean, as we hear, nine thousand Palestinians been killed, fourteen hundred. Um, in Israel, I mean, we've got to look at it, of course, on both sides. But the the, the scale of the atrocities is is significant enough, even if we don't label it genocide. Yaust, if I can bring you in on on the Israeli raids that have been taking place all across the West Bank, but a particular focus on Janin. And I know that your international crisis group has done research on armed groups in Janin. Um, what is your view of how powerful those groups are? Well, we've looked at, uh, at the armed, what we call the new generation of armed groups, and I'll, I'll explain why we call them that. Um, uh, in all areas of the West Bank, they they, they started in Jenin and, and Nablus, but they've also spread to Tulkarim and to Bas, and uh, they're really uh, in, in, in Jericho and, and many other places. We call them the new generation because um, uh, because they're different from what we've seen in the past. In the past. Uh, Palestinian resistance to the military occupation was usually organized through one of the main groups, uh, be it Fatah or the PFLP or Hamas or any of the other groups that uh, together make up the, the Palestinian national movement. These people uh, who, who are now uh, part of these, these new uh, groups do see themselves as part of the Palestinian national movement, broadly speaking, but are not organized in any way and are not linked or associated directly and don't uh, accept the leadership of any of these groups. They are acting autonomously, or if not independently, in coordination with, with others like them on the ground. They may be 
uh, members of one of these groups, but that is irrelevant because they uh, they don't uh, uh, see the boundaries between them. Uh, so, so you could have Fatah and Hamas and PVP fighting next to each other in the same local group. The other thing is that they are based mostly in the urban areas, in area A of the West Bank, and they're, they're mostly responding to Israeli army incursions into area A, where the Israeli army is not supposed to be. So, um, uh, so they, they are self-defense groups in many ways. And they're also, and this has to be said, they're not particularly effective because um, they, they're basically expressing a frustration with a, a, an intolerable status quo. Um, but they consist of, of young people in many cases, or between the ages of 15 and 30, so relatively young, um, who, who are more into performance sometimes than, than actual uh, hardcore resistance. They don't hide their identities in many cases. They uh, put themselves and their identities on social media uh, as a way to, to be seen and to, to be recognized as, as heroes, I suppose. Um, but that is not really a f an effective way of fighting a military occupation. So Israel has been quite uh, effective in, in suppressing uh, these groups. But these groups are a symptom uh, of uh, people's uh, Palestinians' frustration with the military occupation. So while you can suppress some groups, uh, I think the general urge for people to, to resist in, in many different ways, including through armed groups, will, will continue for a long time. So, Marion, that's the Israeli raids that are taking place uh, around the West Bank and particularly in Janine. But Palestinians are facing another threat, are they not? They're facing not just the Israeli military, they're facing the settlers who are marauding gangs around the West Bank. I was speaking to a friend uh, on the West Bank earlier on and I said, who are you more frightened of, the Israeli military or the settlers? And she said to me, it doesn't make a difference. Is that how, what you would say? Um, I, I think it doesn't make a difference in that we forget that Israeli soldiers are also settlers in, in an official state uniform, and that's that. That's what it means. It doesn't make a difference. And again, in the end, a Palestinian killed is a Palestinian killed. It doesn't matter if the the Israeli calling for genocide, killing them, is wearing a uniform or not. But Israeli settlers and and as as we see these different um, communities that have illegally uh, built, basically, settlements in the West Bank by forcibly kicking out Palestinians at gunpoint um, from their homes, and as well as what we have seen in Jerusalem, what we have also seen in Heartland Palestine during the period of 1948 and 1967, is that they don't care. They don't care about international law. They don't care about Palestinian life. The only objective is to push Palestinians out and build this great state of Israel. Um, and as we have seen from the very disturbing language being used by the prime minister, um, Israeli forces, representatives, and, and average Israeli um, settlers, is that Death to Arabs is basically the national slogan, is that Palestinians aren't even real people. Um, uh, they never really existed here. So this Mariam, is kind can of I, the discourse Mariam, that we see. Mariam, Mariam, can I just bring in another aspect to this, uh, which is the international community and what they should do? Because actually, for the first time, um, there have been comments coming from parts of the international community. Listen to this from the State Department spokesman. We have made uh, uh, quite clear to uh, the government of Israel that we are very concerned about settler violence in the West Bank. We find it incredibly destabilizing. We find it counterproductive to Israel's long-term security, uh, in addition to, of course, being extremely harmful to the Palestinians living in the West Bank. Um, and we have sent a very clear message to them that it's unacceptable, it needs to stop, and those responsible for it need to be held accountable. Do you think Israel will listen to words like that coming from its closest ally? It's not coming from its closest ally. It's coming from its comrade in arms. The United States has been de facto fighting on the ground um, against Palestinians in Gaza. It has consistently armed Israel with the weapons that it has today, that it is using to commit genocidal practices um, against Palestinians. And essentially, the U.S. has been tag-teaming with Israel um, to cut off telecommunications, 
to have the systemic malpractice in journalism that we are seeing, which is denying uh, worldwide audiences to really see what's happening on the ground. Well, and we're trying, we're trying, Mariam, here on Al Jazeera. Really we're trying here on Al Jazeera for the world to see what's going on. And, and it's not OK that that is an exception, and that's the anomaly, right? To to Toby, if I can so bring you in. The, that's the issue with the United States. And in the same time, you're having soldiers post on their TikTok accounts and their social media of how they are taking a on corpses of Palestinians or that they are very proud of the way they're, they're committing their torture and abuse against Palestinian detainees. So it really does go to show you that the United States right now is an accomplice in, in in committing crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity. So, so let, so let me just bring in, just, Mar Mariam, just let me bring in, bring in, let me bring in Toby there as the international lawyer. Do you think the threat of, of, of some accountability at some stage could be a restraint on Israel, or are they just not going to listen to anybody? Well, I think the, the threat has to be real. Um, and it has to be backed up with action. I mean, mere condemnation is not going to change anything. Um, I mean, when you talk about the, the position of the international community, um, I was quite ashamed to listen to one of our, our ministers in the United Kingdom yesterday who, who, who said that the, the UK government's position is that Israel is carrying out these actions in accordance with international law. It's 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 shameful and embarrassing to, to hear such statements because it is it is so far away from international law uh, as one could imagine. Um, and I think what the United Kingdom says, what the United States says is is important. I mean, I, I, I listened to uh, statements this morning by a US Senator uh, when asked the question, um, is there anything that you would condemn Israel doing? And, then, and he said, no. Um, he, he wouldn't, and that's that's the problem. And it's uh, Israel is not going to change, and the situation is not going to change unless there is um, real action taken on accountability, um, and that is going to require um, a, a, a very strong position, a brave position, being taken by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, and individuals being charged, whether it is in respect of, of Hamas's actions on the 7th of October and after, uh, whether it's the, the attacks in Gaza or, or the attacks that we're seeing now in the West Bank. Um, all of that has to has to come under, under the, the scrutiny of the International Criminal Court, because you can't have any resolution to this unless you have a process of justice and accountability. We've seen it the world over. If you do not address this, the cycle of violence continues, and it will continue. Toby, thank you. Thank you to all our guests. Joost Hilterman, Marian Barghouti and Toby Cadman. Our extensive coverage continues around the clock with reporting from our teams in the occupied West Bank and Gaza. You'll find it all on aljazeera.com. If you have a comment to add to our discussion, as ever, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or on X, formerly known as Twitter, at AJ Inside Story. For me and all the teams, stay safe. Bye for now.